If you ever happen to find yourself in the coastal rainforest of Alaska and you hear this sound, do yourself a favor. Forget it happened. Try to walk away. Don't, no matter what you do, pick up a rifle and start going off in that direction. Trust me, it leads nowhere. Man, these things are impossible. I'm Steven Ronella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. I love North America's grouse species, all of them, from the roughed grouse in my Michigan homeland to the embattled sage grouse of the short grass prairie. But of all these tasty birds, the one that most holds my fascination is the bird formerly known as the blue grouse. What's so great about them? It's this right here. The haunting and mysterious breeding call of the males in spring. My fascination with this bird began exactly one year ago when I was here in the Tongass National Forest with a couple of hours to kill while waiting for a plane. From a high ridge line, the hoots of several birds rose up from the nearly impenetrable forest below me. What especially caught my interest is that here in Alaska, unlike the rest of the US, you can hunt blue grouse during what's known as the spring hoot. I spent the next year fantasizing about the easy breezy time that I'd have next spring while blissfully stomping through these hills and piling up bag limits of birds. The general way that people hunt these, you just walk around and around and around until you can try to pinpoint one clump of trees he's in. Then you sit down with binoculars and start glassing to try to find a thing up there. Several years ago, the Ornithological Societies of North America declared that what we know as blue grouse are actually two distinct species, the dusky grouse of the interior ranges and the sooty grouse of the coastal ranges. It might seem like a purely academic argument since they look basically the same, but here's the catch. Dusky grouse do the bulk of their hooting on the ground where they're pretty easy to find. Sooties, which they have here in Alaska, hoot up in trees, and I mean way the hell up in trees, 70 to 150 feet up there. The tricky thing about these birds is they're like ventriloquists. You can narrow down the direction about 45 degrees. I hear one somewhere like there. If someone's driving down the road with loud bass, in their car and the windows down, how at first it's hard to pinpoint where it's coming from, it just feels omnipresent. It's like boom, 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 somewhere. That's what this noise is like. The sound just seems to be around everywhere, but nowhere at the same time. And that's when I discovered the sooty grouse's rather aggravating tendency to suddenly shut up. I don't know if he aimed his head in a different direction, like maybe he was just looking this way, and I heard him, and now he's... I decide to abandon the bird that's giving me the silent treatment and head after another bird I heard earlier, wherever it proves to be. The little undulations in the land, I think maybe like the layout of the timber, just affects what you're hearing. And I use the word hearing, but it's more like a feeling, like I can feel that thing from that direction. It's so hard to pinpoint. I keep climbing higher and higher, heading in the vague direction of the bird I heard, or think I heard. These birds would be tricky to spot on a sunny day, but between the fog limiting my view and the rain muffling the sound, I'm not making much progress. I'm not saying I'd find this bird anyways, but now the wind's picking up and it just is noisy out here now. It really muddies the water, you know. So I'm calling it quits on yet another bird. I have no idea why, 
but for some reason I get it into my head that climbing above the snow line might be my ticket to success. If I go as high as I can, I'll at least be able to chase birds in a downhill direction. Now there's something about this bird that makes it seem findable. It sounds as though it's coming from above while most of the surrounding land is down below. That helps narrow things down a bit. I was just 50 yards that way, the way that I 100% absolutely know there's a bird. And I thought that I like felt the noise. Then I thought, no, you didn't. And I came this way. I got up here and I was like, oh, there's one that way. But then I listened again, I'm like, no, he's not that way. He's that way, even though when I was 50 yards that way, he sounded so far away that I didn't think it was one. All the while, I'm out here traipsing around in the rain trying to find one of these things. I just keep trying to not think about the fact that you could buy a whole chicken at a grocery store for a few bucks. This is a ghost chicken, so I think they ought to call it. I named this bird Lost Bird, mark his approximate location on my GPS, and plan to come back tomorrow to make a second try at finding him. to find the bird I call Lost Bird. Sometimes I call him Ghost Bird. He's hooting hardcore off in the fog. I kind of half love and half hate this bird. But just like yesterday, once I get into range of Lost Bird, he stops hooting altogether. This stuff's no joke either, because you get down in there and you wind up where you can't go any further. It just drops off. So I'm really reluctant to dive down in here to try to find him, because I've attempted that a few times and I've just gotten kind of screwed. I decide to keep searching to see if I can pick him up again. I walk myself dizzy, climbing, dropping, side-hilling, circling. All the while, the bird kind of seems to be in the next tree and kind of seems to be way the hell off on another mountain. It's so perplexing, man. He always feels like he's below me. But when I go down low, I can't hear him anymore. If you want to get an idea of what just happened for the last two hours, you'll see on here the waypoint called Lost Bird. And if you look, that blue line is me walking around trying to locate that bird. I need to find a more cooperative bird that I can figure out. And then once I get educated, I'm going to come back and find this guy and kill him and pluck him and cook him. And it's going to be a beautiful day. I feel like it might be good hunting all day. I might just try to go out and walk some logging roads so that I can cover a lot of ground fast. I hear some hooting in the direction of a nearby lake. I've been around long enough to learn that water can play tricks on you when it comes to the proximity of sounds, but never mind that. I set out to find the bird anyway. Clearly, he's on the other side of the lake. I'm at the initial stage of hearing a bird where you feel like maybe you're gonna find it. Give me 10 minutes. But after I hike around to the other side, the hooting seems to be coming from the shore I just left. I thought shooting birds out of trees is supposed to be easy. A lot of times when you're hearing these birds, you'll hear it like, oh, here, right here, okay? And I'll move even 20 yards in the direction I think the bird is, and I won't hear it anymore. Then I'll back up. I'll be like, oh, I hear him. He's that way. I'll move forward 20 yards. 
gone. I head back inland and quickly hear another bird that seems to be coming from one particular clump of trees. I'm gonna just climb this tree and see if that little bit of elevation helps me figure out where the hell this thing is. As I sit up in this tree, you might look at me and think that I'm thinking that this whole blue grouse thing is for the birds and that I'm probably ready to finally call it quits. Can't hear him. But what I'm really thinking is that there's always tomorrow. In the early hours of a mid-April morning, I can't escape the idea that a lot of right-minded Americans are elsewhere in the country hunting wild turkeys, a much bigger and more agreeable bird. It's hard to not juxtapose sooties and turkeys, seeing as how they are both game species with a male that does a lot of vocalizing in the spring in order to draw females toward them. When hunting turkeys, you try to reverse that norm by playing the role of the hen in such an enticing way that you actually draw the male, against his better judgment, toward you. But during the year that I thought about this hunt, I talked to a handful of individuals who had some experience with sooty grouse, and not one of them mentioned trying to call them in. I reckoned that the reason they hadn't tried it was a lack of imagination rather than a lack of evidence that it works. So I found some audio recordings of hen sooty grouse, sent them to some friends at Down and Dirty Outdoors, and they worked me up a reed call that's a dead ringer for a hen sooty. I also had a decoy made from a dusky hen that my friend Shad Brunson killed down in Utah. I set up where I can hear a hooter in the distance, trusting that if I can hear him, he can hear me. If you do see one of these birds in my hand, you're probably gonna be like, he went through all that for that? The decoy and call prove fruitless. I go back to my original strategy. I keep my chin up and walk towards the hooting with a blind faith that something magical might happen. I've come 10 times farther than I thought this bird would. I know I'm getting closer because uh, there's another note that I didn't know about. It's like he ends and I can hear it. Da -da -da. I've thought I was getting close to these birds before, but hearing the volume and clarity of this call, I feel as though I really am close. All I need to do is find him. My fear is if I get too close, I'm gonna spook. Oh, I'll get close to And then, almost by accident, there he is. I got him. I can't believe I found him, but I found him. He's on a dead snake that, at least relative to the forest at large, is as obvious as a flagpole. It's so weird, man. It's like, I'm looking at the bird, so I know where he is. And I got this dead tree in front of me. If I move my head, so that 
view of the bird is blocked. His sound jumps to over there. The best time to spot the bird is when he's hooting his tail. Feather trail coming down out of here. Where's the feather? Oh, here he is, right here. Man, I can't tell you how good, like, it just cool as me hold one of these things after all the time I've spent thinking about trying to come and hunt these in the spring. See, he's got that long, long neck. So when he's making that noise, that whoop, 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 this patch blows up and sticks out of his feathers. And, and the feathers peel away, so he's kind of showing that yellow patch when he dances around. These are very, very good birds to eat. This is one of my favorite game birds. I've never eaten a spring one. You know, I've eaten them in the fall. There can be a difference with the quality of the flesh. During the winter, they live primarily on Douglas fir needles, so I wonder if it couldn't affect the taste. Another cool thing about hunting these birds in the spring like this is it really, uh, you know, it limits your harvest to males. Because if you're just hunting the birds hooting, you're only killing the boys. Like in this area, Southeast Alaska, they think that the hunter harvest on blue grouse might be only 4% of the population. I mean, there's birds out there that just don't, will never hear the crack of a rifle. This is a one of a kind hunt. These are one of a kind birds. I mean, they're beautiful birds that taste great. hard enough for this bird that I don't want the whole thing to be gone in a couple of bites. So I'm just gonna eat the giblets now and then bring the rest of the bird home to roast for my family. I always like gut birds pretty quick after shooting them because they start to get pretty like ripe inside there. It's actually good to hang them if you have the time once you've gutted them. What I'm after is the holy trinity of bird innards, the liver, the heart, and the gizzard. When you clean the gizzard, you wanna make sure to pull this inside layer off. It's like shoe leather, you know? Pull that thing away. It's one of the tougher substances inside an animal. There's probably some industrial application for this thing. Let's drop these into boiling water. But you can even finish a jar of pickles and just save the brine that the pickles come in. Shoot a bunch of birds, boil all the giblets, throw the giblets in there for two weeks, let them come out. You have pickled jibs. I like to eat them in order of toughness, from least to most. And the liver is like, you know, melts in your mouth. The heart's a little tougher. I still chews up nice. The gizzard is. Like you imagine what this muscle's job is, is taking rock and crushing food up with rock like this. So its texture sort of goes along with its jaw where it's just a tough, you know, tenacious little muscle. You have to boil them 45 minutes before they get real tender. My mom always boiled giblets when I was a kid and I'd sit around and eat them out of the pot, you know, while she was cooking birds. 
Good stuff. Now I'll find another one of these. Times like this, your mind can go two different ways. On the one hand, I could just say, you did it, you figured this out. But on the other hand, I'd know that was a load of BS and that I hadn't figured a thing out. That old cliche about blind squirrels getting a nut now and then keeps coming to mind. Me being the blind squirrel and the giblets in my stomach being a part of the nut. I cannot escape the reality that these birds are still a mystery. Lost bird is still lost. And as I pick the last few strands of rubbery gizzard from my teeth, I'm already living in next year, when I'm gonna find me someone special who really is dialed in on sooties. And we're gonna come back up here and do this thing the right way. Stay tuned.